Greetings and a hearty welcome to JW Broadcasting. This JW Broadcasting episode is led by Samuel Hurd and his friend What's His Name. And I can only assume What's His Name is here so Sammy does as little as possible. After all, he's the most tired looking of all of them and the one who I feel makes the least effort when he's talking. That way, Sammy can focus on his dumb speech about how Jehovah loves you even if you're ugly. I'm not kidding, that's literally what his speech is about. Movies and television have blinded many to reality, making them feel that the beauty of the human body must look like the handsome and beautiful movie stars and famed athletes. However, comparing ourselves to them can often be very disappointing, time-consuming, and even expensive. If you go to great lengths to try to look more like another person. It's true, some have been born with a physical impairment or disability. This may be obvious to others. And some unkind people might have made comments or teased the person. That can make the person feel self-conscious or even create a feeling of low self-esteem. This can become so ingrained in one's thinking that he might begin to feel no one could love him. And at times, that kind of erroneous thinking can even affect a person's view of Jehovah's love. However, please be assured that Jehovah loves us despite our physical appearance. That's right, Jehovah loves you despite the physical appearance he gave you. This is a boring and nonsensical speech that we'll be mostly skipping because there's no way any Jehovah's Witness is awake for most of this. Especially because since Samuel Heard is from the governing body, he can't help but to make it all about himself. Let's look at a picture of yourself when you were, let's say, 17. And then look at one when you are in your 80s. You say, that's not me. Oh, yes it is. We really didn't need to hear this, and most people who are listening won't be able to relate because they aren't 80. But I guess Sammy just wanted an excuse to show a photo he just found of himself when he was a child. Jehovah's view of beauty is different from ours. Close your little eyes for a minute and see with your mind's eye a beautiful bird. Now open your eyes. Which bird did you see? Was it an indigo bunting? A cardinal? Or a Baltimore Oriole? Those are beautiful birds. But does Jehovah prefer one bird over another just because of its beauty or appearance? See, this speech is definitely aimed at the old people in the audience who love to bird watch. All to let them know that sure, they may be ugly now, but Jehovah loves them despite them being ugly because they serve his religion. And that's where the value is for the God of a cult. Yes, Jehovah looks at you and sees the secret person of the heart that came to love your God, the universal sovereign. You cannot take that aspect away from the attention of Jehovah. If you love him, like Jesus indicates you can, he loves you, despite any external appearances. And that's the indoctrination lesson of today. If you love Jehovah and therefore live your life the way his governing body decides to, then Jehovah will love you because your relationship with Jehovah is directly proportional to how committed you are to the cult. And now, he's going to show you a few stock photos of what he calls the animal kingdom, even though half of them aren't from animals, to tell you how being perfect humans will mean there's still variety. Yes, that's the only point to this. The animal kingdom, which is the product of Jehovah's perfect activity, contains enormous variety. Our perfect earth is likewise filled with variety, change, and contrast. It allows for the simple and the complex, the plain and the fancy, the sour and the sweet, 
the rough and the smooth, the meadows and the woods, the mountains and the valleys. It embraces the stimulating freshness of early spring, the warmth of summer. This goes for a while and just shows that Samuel heard thinks animal kingdom means outside. But let's skip the rest of this boring speech to go back to yet another section of My Teen Life, a segment written by grown adults about the importance of remaining indoctrinated in every aspect as you grow up, especially when it comes to personal grooming. Oh, most definitely I felt awkward. I didn't wear my clothes a certain way, or I didn't have my hair kept a certain way. Um, I didn't wear the latest shoes. It can be really easy to get caught up on social media and trying to see what the new trends were, trying to see how others look. Should I look like that? Why don't I look like that? What can I do to look like that? And I paid such a high price for the body I was going after. I was going after unrealistic beauty standards. It led me to being diagnosed with an eating disorder. Uh, focusing on my appearance too much affected me spiritually. Even though I was in service, even though I was uh, in meeting, even though I was present for family worship, uh, I wasn't focused. I was thinking more of what I'm going to wear tomorrow. Jehovah's Witnesses have very few dress and grooming options, which basically go down to how white people dressed in the 1950s. You'll rarely see a Jehovah's Witness in their propaganda wearing jeans or anything that is in khakis or slacks with polos for men and modest dresses or loose slacks with a loose blouse for women. And that's the most casual Jehovah's Witnesses portray themselves. People can't wear any hairstyle that doesn't conform to those standards, meaning men can't wear anything that's more than very short side and slightly longer top if you're a man and long conservative hair if you're a woman. This form of extreme control exerted on followers takes a toll on them because they aren't allowed to express themselves even with their clothes. However, expressing yourself with your clothes is huge when you're growing up, and that's what causes these feelings of insecurity and not fitting in. Because Jehovah's Witnesses are always looking in silence to the freedoms the rest of the world have and lying to themselves, trying to gaslight themselves into thinking that they are happy with the way that they present themselves when they clearly aren't. But obviously, the solution to this issue is the same solution to every issue when you're in a cult, more indoctrination. Knowing that I'm making Jehovah happy by helping others get to know him and making disciples is what makes me happy now. And as a pioneer, I finally was able to attend my first pioneer school in March of 2021, which was an amazing blessing from Jehovah. I work on um, being more um, open to people, being more present, um, being more I'm available. And trust me, it, it paid off for me because uh, eventually I received much more privileges in the congregation. Uh, I was able to serve in different capacities in Jehovah's organization. And above all, I was more happier. There is no way this girl has converted any people into the religion. Otherwise, they would have actually mentioned that. But obviously, the solution of indoctrinating yourself and others work out because if it hadn't worked out, then they wouldn't be showing you this. But now, let's listen to a speech telling us the only thing that makes you valuable to Jehovah is how indoctrinated you are. What do you think makes us valuable to Jehovah? Is it our natural ability? Our many years of faithful service? Is it our Bethel assignment? Well, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll let uh, Jehovah answer this uh, through his word for us. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll read verse 4. But let it be the secret person of the heart, in the incorruptible adornment of the quiet and mild spirit, which is of great value in the eyes of God. Now, of course, we know in the full context of the opening verses here in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter is referring to Christian women. But if we isolate this phrase in verse 4, the secret person of the heart, 
Well, that applies to all of us, brothers and sisters, because it's referring to who we are on the inside, our thoughts, our beliefs, our emotions. That's why David prayed in Psalm 51, verse 10, for Jehovah to create within him a pure heart, because that's what Jehovah sees and examines. That is what is valuable to him. And that's what all of us are striving to do, to serve him in that way. And the beautiful thing is that when Jehovah sees that we're trying to serve him this way, not only does that make us valuable to him, but he will also give us whatever we need in whatever assignment we happen to have. A relationship with the God of the Jehovah's Witnesses is very conditional on how well you can conform your personality, emotions, and thoughts to what the governing body decides God cares about. You're gaslit thinking you are the only one who isn't the perfect Jehovah's Witness, when in reality, almost everyone is putting up a front like you and pretending they are spiritual because that's the only thing that makes them valuable to the eyes of Jehovah, and therefore to the eyes of everybody else. Even if we're privileged to do many things in the organization, we should never let our intellect, our privilege, our position, our natural abilities stop us from seeking Jehovah's direction first. That can help us to maintain humility, to keep us valuable to Jehovah. He says it out loud, you're not smart enough to not follow the direction of the religion, and that's what makes you valuable to God. This ridicule and infantilizing speech only serves to remind Jehovah's Witnesses that they either follow Jehovah the way the governing body sees fit, or they're proud and invaluable. Christian love, everybody. Like a father wants his child to succeed. That's how he feels about you and me. He sifts through us and sees where we shine and who we can be in paradise. So always know that He cares He knows you, He knows me What we feel, what we see When we try hard to give our best The joys we feel and our regrets He knows you This is a pretty mid-song that will be forgotten by Jehovah's Witnesses about how Jehovah knows you and sees you at every moment and it sounds like even at Bethel they know just how boring this song is. Beautiful. Did you hear the line, He knows you, he knows me, what we need, what we plead? It's so catchy and uplifting. I think we'll all be singing He Knows Us for days to come. For it. Days to come? I bet with any other song he would have at least said weeks to come. I know I still hum Jehovah give me courage, or as I like to sing it, Jehovah give me cooper. Jehovah give me cooper, but uh, that's, 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 I should get back to the video. In 2001, there was an interview published in Jehovah's Witness magazines about a woman who was deaf and blind, but was still a faithful Jehovah's Witness. And they're about to ask just how much more indoctrination they can squeeze out of this victim in the segment of Where Are They Now? Being both deaf and blind is challenging. I've had to learn how to live independently. But the most important thing that I've learned is learning about Jehovah, the true God. This section has nothing to do with the Bible and everything to do with comparing yourself to others. The only purpose of this interview is for Jehovah's Witnesses to compare themselves to her and to think, well, if she's doing so much for her religion, then what's my excuse? With examples of her acting according to her indoctrination, even when it's especially difficult. But then COVID-19 hit and I was stuck at home, isolated. While it's true that we still had meetings and service arrangements on Zoom, it wasn't easy. The only person who could interpret for me was my husband. 
no one else. It was tough. He was exhausted. We both were. It was something we had to endure. In time, when it became safe enough, a few of the brothers and sisters volunteered to come and help interpret. That really built me up. I could finally have direct contact with my friends. I was thrilled. I also receive a lot of support from the congregation. There are many willing volunteers to tactile interpret for me at the meetings. That gives me joy. I always know that if I have a problem, I can share my thoughts and feelings with others. They will listen and support me. That's right. She needs someone to interpret everything the religion says to her. And what the religion says is so much that it can be too much for a single person to interpret. She has obviously found a supported group inside the Jehovah's Witnesses, but I bet she would have found a better support at a local group of support for the blind or deaf, where she wouldn't be forced to consume a ridiculous amount of propaganda every day to be valuable to them. Faith grows strong when we imitate the faith of fellow Christians like Janice and those in the Bible who love Jehovah. When we read God's word, we want to visualize what life was like for these people of faith. We want to see what they saw, hear what they heard, and feel what they felt. We must immerse ourselves in their stories. We're happy to debut a new series that we hope will help you do just that. Please enjoy the first episode of the series, Imitate Their Faith. See, this is all so you can compare yourself to her. And they literally came out and said it so. And if you're wondering why Samuel Heard is introducing this segment when his helper has introduced every other segment so far, it's because Sammy is from the governing body. So he's the one who gets to introduce this new drama series, where they take accounts of the Bible and retell it with a Jehovah's Witness lens. Abram, dinner's almost ready. Please tell Shem. We'll be right there, Mom. Well, Abram, before we go in, let me tell you the rest. I was just a young man back then. After Jehovah gave my father the command to build the ark, it took decades to complete. Then we had to gather food and all the animals. We had no idea how long we would be inside. But when Jehovah closed the ark's door, we were ready. So were you scared? Abram, I know you're just a boy, but things have happened to you that have scared you, right? Mm -hmm. I was older than you, but I was still scared. When we were building the ark, people thought we were crazy. And then, just like Jehovah said it would, it happened. The story of kid Abram learning about the floor from Shem is completely absent from the Bible, but it lets Jehovah's Witnesses pretend that Abraham knew about the flood when there is nothing in the Bible to support that narrative. Let's see how long they can go telling that Abraham story before telling something that isn't in the Bible. Abram and Sarai lived in Ur, a city full of people who worshipped pagan gods. But like Noah and Shem, Abram and Sarai worshipped Jehovah. Abram. Abram, go out from your land and from your relatives and come into the land that I will show you.
will we live? We'll be so far away from our family. I have every confidence that if we do what Jehovah asks, that things will turn out fine. Well, wherever it is, I will be by your side. And we got to the unbiblical part. This conversation is nowhere in the Bible, but it's often depicted among Jehovah's Witnesses to show how willing they have to move to work wherever their religion tells them to, and to pretend that's just what people in the Bible did. There should be no quarreling between me and you, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land available to you? Please, separate from me. If you go to the left, then I will go to the right. Though it must have hurt their hearts, they agreed to part ways. Lot moved east to the district of the Jordan, where the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were located. After Lot had gone, Jehovah made a promise about Abram's future. Raise your eyes, please, and look from the place where you are to the north and south, east and west, because all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring as a lasting possession. And I will make your offspring like the dust particles of the earth. Abram, Abram, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield for you. Your reward will be very great. Sovereign Lord Jehovah, what will you give me, seeing that I continue childless? Go outside, look up, please, to the heavens and count the stars if you are able to do so. So your offspring will become. Later, Jehovah changed Abram's name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. This is exactly why people in old Israelite culture thought that having no children was a curse from their God and demonized women who couldn't have children. But let's see how they depict angels this time with apparently less budget and show us how bad Jehovah's Witnesses are at acting. But they also brought other news. Through one of the angels, Jehovah said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is very heavy. Will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous men within the city. Will you then sweep them away and not pardon the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are inside it? It's unthinkable of you. Will the judge of all the earth not do what is right? If I find in Sodom 50 righteous men in the city, I will pardon the whole place for their sake. Please hear I presume to speak to Jehovah, whereas I am dust and ashes. Suppose the fifty righteous should lack five. Because of the five, will you destroy the whole city? Abraham knew that the judge of all the earth always does what is right. But knowing and trusting are two different things. I will not destroy it for the sake of the twenty. Jehovah, please do not become hot with anger, but let me speak just once more. Suppose only ten are found there. I will not destroy it for the sake of the ten. This is just terrible acting and terrible special effects to recount the story of how God slaughtered a couple of cities because they weren't living up to his standards. Weirdly enough, in the original story, God sends his angels to see if there are good souls in the city, which is why this conversation happens. This shows how in ancient Israel, God wasn't all-knowing nor all-powerful, 
because he needed to send his angels as messengers and explorers, meaning that's how God was getting his information. If God was all-knowing, then he wouldn't have needed to send a few explorers to find people worth saving in the towns, because God would obviously already know if there are any. Do you want to see part two of the story of Abraham? Me too. But we have to wait till next month, so be sure to tune in. Imitate Their Faith has been a beloved series in the Watchtower magazine since 2008. And more recently, it's been online at jw.org. Honestly, I didn't even know this was a series in the magazines, but this is the latest of the articles and series that used to be printed and now are being adapted to being portrayed in video because this religion is moving away from the publications that made them famous and into producing audiovisual content that they can't monetize. And you should be thankful not to Jehovah, but to the governing body. Thank you, Brother Hurd. And please, thank the governing body for providing the new Imitate Their Faith series. This immediately reminded me of the example of Moses and how he said it was due to him that he was able to get water from a rock instead of thanking Jehovah. And as punishment, Jehovah didn't let him into the promised land. This is yet another show of how blatant the cult of personality is becoming. You have to love and thank the governing body for doing the jobs that they supposedly got from God, instead of them thanking God for being in a position where they can serve others. They're clearly asking more and more credit and adulation. And I really hope that some Jehovah's Witnesses realize what's happening, because it has a pretty good shot at being what wakes them up. Let's visit three congregations in the Sonrico area. These congregations, each with fewer than 60 publishers, still deliver a mighty shout of praise. The tsunami and resulting disaster had a big effect on those in the territory. Many began to realize that spiritual things are more important than what we can see. Our brothers have done their best to fill the void that many are feeling with the Bible's message of hope. Since the 2011 disaster, 20 Bible students have dedicated themselves to Jehovah and have gotten baptized. Usually, we skip the postcard at the end, but I found amazing how open they are about the importance of using tragedies to convert people. And they even note how 20 people have converted since the tsunami. Although, they don't let us know how many of them were Jehovah's Witness children who are only getting baptized because they were born in a Jehovah's Witness family. And with that, this JW Broadcasting episode comes to a close. Thank you so much to my supporters, especially these ones over here. You can help me make these as fast as possible and, and watch these videos as soon as I have them ready to go if you're a patron. Subscribe if you want to tune in to see what these old colonialist farts have to say in next month's JW Broadcasting. <laughs>